and pray. Well, now we're on Daniel chapter 10, just running through that. I mean, Daniel 9 took a while to get through because it was so strong. And by 10, I think we're going to be able to do that in one night. Um, uh, not that there's not a lot in every little bit of Daniel right now, because we're in the prophetic part of Daniel, and he continues to have um, uh, visions and, and dreams about the end times, and his prophetic words are, um, his prophetic visions are just as important and amazing as they were in chapter 9. Chapter 9, those last four verses, um, I've read several things that people have said those are the those are the most pivotal uh, prophetic words in all of the Bible, which is pretty amazing. It just ties into so many other books. You know, it refers obtusely. If you have read Zechariah, it refers to that. If you've read Nehemiah, it refers to that. It's it, you know, it, it it's in conjunction with that. It's in conjunction with Isaiah, just like we talked about last week. So. It is one of those things that ties everything all together. And one commentator that I read um, said that you, because of how specific it was with the edict of Darius and then going to the triumphal entry up to the day, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of days, and you go up to the day, and that's the exact day that the, that the triumphal entry happened. I mean, who but God could do that? I mean, just amazing. And, ha- you know, it's that Jesus wasn't sitting there with a calculator figuring it out. He was just obeying the Father. And so it's just uh, amazing that uh, the prophetic and the deity of Christ and all of those things can be proven by those four verses if if you can just really um, sit still long enough to get all of the connections and how it comes together. It's pretty amazing. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that... Um, Thank you, Lord, that Daniel wrote this. We thank you, Father, that he shut it up according to your word and according to your Holy Spirit until such a time as this. We thank you, Lord, that it gives us insight into where we are in the prophetic calendar. We also thank you, Lord, that you um, have told us over and over again that you'll be with us through this time, that you'll be our strength, that you will be our God. We depend on you in these last days, Lord. Um, whether it is us or our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren, I don't know that it's going to go any further than those three generations. But we know that you know the Lord. And we just ask that your um, your divine um, import would be for us today, that we would understand you would open to us your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things um, just in in praying – you know, about the things that are going to happen before the Lord comes back. And one of the things is that this word of, uh, will go forth to the world. And the amazing things that they're, that they're doing right now, they have a, um, I was uh, listening to a guy talk about, um, they put a, the whole Bible on, um, in, in the language of the country that they're going into, um, uh, and it's the size and the shape of a Tic Tac. So you can put them in this little tic-tac box <laughs> oh, wow. and carry all these Bibles in. You know, <laughs> it's just like a phenomenal uh, how they're getting the word into um, these countries that that don't allow that. And on the heels of that, I was talking to somebody who was talking about the, um, oh, I wish I could remember this guy's name. If I tell you that there's a guy that goes all around the United States and does worship and um and uh sean worship meetings sean yeah director yeah something yeah yeah Yeah. he was just if you're if you follow him you probably know the story better than i do because i don't follow anybody because i don't do facebook but um or instagram or anything like that but he um he apparently was uh conducting a meeting and, and police came and they told him if they play one note he will be arrested and you know, for worship or anything. And, and he had all the permits, he had everything in place. And so he just went for it and they didn't arrest him. So it was just, if you remember back in, in uh, Nehemiah with Sam Ballot and, and Tobiah, how he always made fun of um, Nehemiah and said, you know, you're, you're going to bail and all of this. It's just, 
It's just that same kind of thing. But the fact that it's police officers in the United States of America doing this, that's the thing. It's kind of like, what? That's supposed to happen in other countries, not here, you know. And so it's just the times that we live in, we need to, we need to, well, we'll talk about that tonight. That's, that's really the, that leads right into this, this chapter. Okay, in the third year of Cyrus, I am reading Daniel chapter 10 in the ESV. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who is named Belteshazzar. So this um, Daniel is proven, has been proved himself to be a man of prayer, found to be faithful, and found to be strengthened of God. And uh, to go through the events of his life. And so that is one of the stances that we need to take in these last days. We need to be people of prayer. Being a person of prayer is not difficult because prayer is not hard. Right. It's just hard to remember to do, you know, hard to be faithful, hard to, it's not difficult to pray. It's, it's just difficult to uh, remember to pray, to uh Maybe to have the skills of listening to God. And, and I think that that's easier than what people make it harder than it is. So we just really need to be people of prayer. And that is a totally doable thing. Um, chapter 11 is tied to chapter 10. So we're going to cover that next week, of course. And so that's just going to be going to lead into that. But um, the only way that Daniel is going to be brought through these visions, as we'll see, is through prayer. So the third Year of uh, Cyrus, Daniel prayed and God gave him res- re- revelation. Um, the worship and prayer is what gave him understanding. Um, and, um, and the word was true and, and it was a great conflict. It's just so funny. You know, the, the guy that, one of the people that I, that I listened to uh, in preparation for this, there are commentaries that I read, there's word studies that I do, and and then there is uh, a man who, when he teaches, he teaches from from the um, uh, from the Tanakh, from the um, Hebrew Scriptures, and he's translating it into English as he's reading it. I had a professor in um, in college who did that in Greek. You know, his his daily de- his devotional before class starts. Obviously, I went to Christian school. Um, it was, was phenomenal, but he would read the Greek and he would be translating it in his mind. And, and so it was his translation of that day. And this guy does the same thing. And in the comments below, people are always saying, what version are you using? What version are you using? (laughs) Because, because this translation sometimes is like, okay, well in the Hebrew, this is what this means. And this is, and the word was true. And it was, this is verse 10, it was great conflict, and he understood the word, and he had an understanding of the, of the vision. The word great conflict can be, can, be, um, can be translated large army. So it was a large army, and it gave him understanding of the word and the vision and the insight. So in this, in this, um, uh, first verse, we see that there's a conflict that's arising and that there is there is spiritual warfare at the very beginning of this and at the end of it and in the middle of it. Daniel is right in the thick of it. Daniel has proven himself faithful for years and years and years, faithful man of prayer, faithful man of understanding, faithful man of wisdom. Uh, you know, he gets his first prophetic vision when he's, what, 20, 21, which isn't all of that all that unusual because Joseph did too when he was a young man. So it's not like you have to be old to get anything like this from God, but more times than not, the richness of the word, the richness of the vision, you'll see Daniel maturing in this. And so he doesn't have real simple visions. They're very complex. Okay. So, um, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. That is a significant uh, verse. And a lot of times when we go to these things, like um, as, as a Gentile, I'm reading this. Okay, he was mourning for three weeks. I have no idea why he isn't, why he's mourning. 
but um, what I understood is that mourning for 21 days is re- a direct reference to lamentations. And there were difficult times in Lamentations. Lamentations is all about the siege of Jerusalem. And um, in that time of a siege, uh, and it was the siege that Babylon came against Jerusalem, and Jerusalem finally fell, and that's when they, that's the second visitation that Nebuchadnezzar did to, um, to Jerusalem. If you remember, we talked about this before. It's the second time that he attacked Jerusalem, and the second time he decimated it. The first time he just took some captives and he let another person be a ruler over. Um, he let another person be a, a viscount or whatever uh, over Jerusalem and just pay tribute. But then they uprose and they tried to take they tried to take Jerusalem back because they had some false prophets who said that that would be a cool thing. And then they had some prophets who said, "No, don't listen to them." They're not, um, they're not speaking the truth. Um, anyway, they weren't speaking the truth. And so it ended up is that uh, it ended up that um, Israel was conquered, that Jerusalem was conquered and that, that and it was, it was completely decimated. The temple was burned. The walls were torn down. Um, and, and in those 21 days, they, um, they did atrocities against the people of Israel, um, there are some estimates that they killed a million Jews in that in that time. So it was one of those horrendous times in the Jewish, um, with the Jewish understanding. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. That was in remembrance or in memory of that of that um, time. And and there is uh, still on the Jewish calendar this 21 days of mourning. And so if a Jewish person is reading this 21 days of mourning, oh, I know what that, that is. You know, that's like saying spring break or, you know, I mean, that is like we get that. We understand those kinds of terms. And so would the Jewish people. Mourning for three weeks is code for that lamentation. So um, I ate no delicacies, no meat, no wine, entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, okay, so in between uh, verse 3 and verse 4, not that I think this makes a whole lot of difference, but um, that was six months later because it is the 21st, 24th day of the first month. That is the month of redemption. That is 10 days after the Passover. So 10 days after the Passover, he was by the river uh, Tigris. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes, lifted up my eyes. Whenever you see that in scripture, it means that they were praying. Okay. So whenever David says, I lift up my eyes into the hills from whence comes my help, help, my help comes from the Lord. So he's not lifting his eyes up to the hills and praying to the hills. He's praying to God, but he's lifting his eyes up. When you lift your eyes up in the scripture, that's always going to be code for um, praying, prayer. And we need to know those things because we're not Jewish people. And because we're not Jewish people, we can miss a lot of stuff like that. So I lifted up my eyes and looked. So he was praying. And then he looked and behold, a man clothed in linen. This is so Daniel. Daniel's minding his own business and praying. You know, I think that Daniel had many days that were normal. But we're talking, we're, <laughs> we're in on all of his days that were not so normal. And he's because as he's praying, and all of a sudden there is a man clothed in linen, with a belt of gold from, uh, from Uphaz around his waist. Now everyone thinks that's an angel. So I, who am I to disagree with that? I'm pretty sure that it was too. He lifted up his eyes to pray, and there was a man in white linen with gold sash, and he and um, and uh, his body was like beryl. Um, that really means his is a shiny rock. Um, that's what his his body looked like a, a shiny rock. In other words, it glowed and it was hard. And um, he saw a man with a white sash and fine gold and a shiny rock. Uh, and then his face was like the appearance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and legs like a gleam of burnished bronze. And the sound of his words was like the sound of a, of a multitude. So when he spoke, it sounded like there were several voices coming from him. Obviously, angelic voice boxes are not the same as ours. 
because somehow he sounded like a whole lot of people talking at the same time, saying the same thing. Um, so it's a multitude, it's a heavenly voice that, that he, and he is going to, um, he is going to receive revelation. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great tem- trembling fell upon them and they fled to hide themselves. This should be reminiscent to you. You should go ding, 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 ding in your head and go, oh, that sounds familiar. When, did, when else did that happen? When Paul saw the great light on the road to um, Damascus and he was knocked off his, well, there's not really any reference to an animal that he was knocked off of, but he fell to the ground. And so some people think he fell off of an animal. Maybe he did, but, but I can't say that he fell off a donkey because it doesn't say that. It, it, he might have. Anyway, he fell to the ground and there was a white light and he was hearing, Paul was hearing a voice, but the people that were with him weren't hearing the same thing that Paul was hearing. But a great trembling fell upon them too. This is very reminiscent when we see Dan- this happening to Daniel and we see that happening to Paul. Um, of course, now Paul was very well versed in the scriptures. So when that was happening to him, I am certain he thought of Daniel. Because it's not like um, like he went home and, and was reading the Bible and goes and re- reading his scrolls and then go, oh, yeah, that happened to me too. I think he knew that as soon as it happened. There are certain things that God shows up with, with Jewish people and he shows up with them in the same way as he showed up in the Old Testament and they go, oh, that's God. It's the same way when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, um, we see that in the middle, uh, right in the middle of this, there's a wind, the sound of a mighty rushing wind in the room where they were gathered, but there was no wind. And there was a, 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 a pillar of fire in the middle of that room and tongues of fire broke off of that middle, that, that column of fire and, and deposited on each person's head. Um, many, many years ago, I heard it taught exactly like that. And I've always kind of gone, but I don't really see that in the scripture. I don't know. And then Bill Shiver taught it just like that. And I went, yes, that's how I'm going to teach it from now on because <laughs> Because he knows, he knows all of the research and stuff. Anyway, so when they see a column of fire in the middle of the room, they're good Jewish people, and they know that's God. Why? A pillar of fire. A pillar of fire is what they followed in the in the, in the desert, right? A cloud by day, a fire by night. So this fire shows up, and they go, "Oh, that's God." Why? It's in their it's in their culture. With us, we might call the fire department, but with them, they knew exactly what it was. They knew it was God. And the same thing with Paul when he experienced this very same kind of thing that Daniel did. So I was left alone because they, they, they booted it out of there. These people fled and hid themselves. That's not what happened with um, Paul. But, um, but they did uh, feel some dread uh, on them. So I was left alone and saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. So when, uh, when um, Daniel receives this word from God, it is so strong, that angelic is so strong, that he has no strength left in him at all. It, uh, in the Hebrew, it is the essence of him left him. I don't know that he died, but, you know, it's, that's, that is the verbiage that is used in the Hebrew that the essence of Daniel left him. And um, so he was, he had no strength left in him. My radiant um, appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. And then I heard the sound of his words. And as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep. I got to the page with my face to the ground. Okay. So here he is. His strength leaves him. This is a, and, and we are going to find out that this is a vision from the last days. And it shows the power was taken away from him. And I, Daniel, God got Daniel's attention. Absolutely. And at that time, Daniel was drained away. And this is going to be speaking of, of 
Israel. It's also going to be speaking of believer, believers, difficulties in the church. Daniel did not have strength, and we will be the same. There will be, um, these last days are going to be, we need to approach these last days not with fear, but with, but not with trepidation, not with anxiety, not with fear in that way. But we need to experience the fear of the Lord, the understanding that God has everything under his feet, that we are his and that he will we, He is in the job of keeping us. The Bible says, as long as it's one of my favorite verses, he is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious throne without spot and with joy. So it is God's job to keep you. It is his job to keep us. It is our job to obey him. So he doesn't leave you alone. He doesn't leave you by yourself. He doesn't leave you with not understanding what way is up. The key is you have to listen. You have to be aware. And you have to, don't, you have to give God a little bit more time than you do a microwave. When we just have, you know, we microwave popcorn in five minutes or less than and if we give God that much of, of silence, we're doing pretty good. And um, that's not, it takes longer, not for God, it takes longer for us to quiet ourselves in this society. Unless you're very practiced at it, it takes a while to get into that place of peace. It, gets into, it takes a, a little bit longer to get into a place where you can hear God. I, I hear people say, I, I just don't hear God anymore. And I'm thinking... How much time do you put into this? How much, how much do you push away the things that are coming to you as you're saying, okay, God, I'm going to sit before you. You sit before you and what happens? Your to-do list pops up in your head, right? Um, and then, um, oh, yeah, I've got to remember to do this and I've got to remember to do that. And, oh, uh, I should call so-and-so. And, you know, <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, you're every which way but focused on God. And so we have to continually push those things away until there aren't any more of them and get to that place of peace where we just sit before the Lord and say, you are God. You are God. I think one of the most amazing things to me in this last chapter, in chapter nine, when we say that the last four verses were this huge prophetic thing. But before that, you have Daniel just going off on how great God is. He doesn't seem to be worried about much of anything. He just seems to be practiced, well practiced in, in adoration of his God. God speaks to us when, when we are in the midst of adoration. It's uh, a little bit more difficult for us to hear when we're in a place of worry, when we're in a place of concern, when we're in a place of anxiety and trepidation. Michelle. I'm wondering also, Jan, and I may be, you know, spiritualizing it, um, as you said, you, you're talking about um, retaining no strength, you know, as the scripture, and it's God's job to hold things together and so forth. I'm wondering if it also, you know, in for these last times means the inefficacy, the ineffectiveness of the body mm -hmm. of Christ and Israel, both that mm -hmm. there, you know, even in our belief uh, in the one true God, that's not enough either. That, you know, that verse that comes to my mind is not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so mm -hmm. in these end times, the church is weak. I mean, the American church is in many places. I'm not saying everywhere, but I know. Forgive me for saying this, if this is wrong, but it's patsy in many ways. It's it's easy. It's self, you know, it's assimilated think, so much of the world and stuff. I think you're right um, in that um, we see we see in the church a remnant, the same as Israel was. God always referred to a remnant. I don't know about it. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm going to just assume that all of us in this room, all of this, all of us in this study want to be part of that remnant. 
I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to be, not that God will come back and not take me home. I'm not saying that. I don't want to be part of, I want to do and be everything that God's called me to do and be. I want to be successful in everything that I do for, for God. And it doesn't mean my success is based on obedience, not on fruit. Put it that way. Because honestly, the what if all you do what if all you do is what if all you are called to do there what if all you are called to do is to plant and you never harvest? Are you obedient? Yes. Is is God saying, Well done, good and faithful servant? Yes. Because you're planting and that's what you're called to do. I um I occasionally get a chance to lead someone to the Lord. That's very occasional. Most of the time I clean the fish. I don't fish the fish out of the water. <laughs> I clean the fish. And, and um, you know, people come and they get, they come to Jesus and they need to get cleaned up. They're, they're, they need to turn their back on sin. And, you know, that is really what my call is for the most part. So, so we can't look at, uh, when we look at the church, we have to look at, is the church obedient? And I think you're right, Michelle. I think the church is steeped in disobedience right now. And um, and we get all sidetracked into silly things like masks and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, when when everything is falling apart every, every which way, um, we, we argue about things that are trivial in comparison. We need to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. I think that what happens in the world is important for us to know so we can pray, but not so we can wring our hands and say, oh, no, no. Because if there's anything that God has really shown me in the last year, it's that phrase that Jesus said, and I've said it many times in this class, that Jesus said, these things must be. You know, these things must be. So, uh, you know, tribulation and persecution and, uh, you know, all of these things that we really, I don't like the sound of those. I really do not like the sound of those. I don't like the sound of those for the United States of America. I don't, in my particular backyard, I don't like the sound of those for Kyrgyzstan. I don't like, <laughs> I don't like the sound of those things. Um, but these things must happen and then the end will come. We are not citizens of this world. We are we touch heaven, and if we forget that, then we run the risk of going sideways. And in the last days, it says many will fall away if it were possible, even the elect. Um, so, I mean, I just was talking to um, one of the members of my family and the extended family, and in their extended family, the brothers and sisters are not following Jesus. And they were all raised very strongly. And it's like all of a sudden they, they identify with being uh, atheistic. Not just that they're grown cold, but, and not just that they're apathetic, but they say there is no God. What? What happened? And so this, this falling away has started. And there's a great... In the end times, there's going to be a great falling away. There's also going to be a great sweeping in. So there's going to be a, you know, a great uh, harvest that comes as well. And my hope is in that harvest that there will be prodigals as well, because that's, that's my prayer. But I don't, want, I don't want to lose anybody that I love. I don't want to be lost myself. I, uh, you know, it's very important that we have this place of worship, of prayer, and of obedience. I think that that keeps us in really good stead um, when we're talking about the end times. Um, There's one scripture that I keep thinking of, and that's in Jeremiah 29. And he says that we're supposed to, he'll be found of him if we seek him with all of our heart. And too much of the time we let other things, other things get in the way. And that's among Christians, too. We can get so preoccupied with other things that are going on. I've been floored by different people. And while 
COVID has been going on, they're so concerned about certain kinds of things rather than just, this is the time for us to seek God and cry out because there are millions, even billions of people in a place of, of we don't know what's happening. We, we need to be praying. We need to be seeking God and we need to be extending ourselves and to, to other people as God leads us to do that. And we can get so caught up in, in other kinds of things. And that's really what the enemy wants to do. He wants us to get distracted. And that's how I think part of the, the um, great falling away is going to happen. People just get distracted and they, they keep moving further and further away. If you're on a path, yes. you know, mm -hmm. you start going one here, you're supposed to be going this way and you go a little bit that way. And after a while, that distance gets far apart. And so it just yes. reminds us all that we need to seek God with all of our heart so that we stay covered by his love, that we're totally in his will. Because the Bible says in Jude, now he's able to keep us from falling and present us um, faultless before, before his glory. Yeah. So, yeah. Amen. And so that, joy, yeah. that's what we need to do is really seek after him. Well, that's exactly true. And you're you're right. People don't wake up in the morning and say, I don't think I believe in God anymore. I think I'm going to be atheistic. It doesn't just happen like overnight. There is a there is a falling away. It is a process. And um, we just need to actually we need to understand that that is what happens or what can possibly happen. And then we need to also be aware that we need to um, be good brothers and sisters and call people back before they get too far. What are you doing? Don't do that. Verse 10. We need to get going here. Um, and behold, a, man, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. So he left all of his strength left. All of his strength left. And, and this um, the hand of this angel probably um, touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. So now he's on his hands and knees. He was flat on his face. Now he's on his hands and knees. And he said to me, oh, Daniel, man greatly loved. And that is um, greatly loved. It also can be greatly desired. Um, uh, you know, like he really has a sense of, of this angel is speaking that you are um, greatly loved. You are one that's favored. Um, he said, stand um, uh, greatly loved. Understand the words I speak to you. Stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. So stand up. I want you to listen to what I have to say. The angel is really saying that. That's Angels, when they first start off, they most of the time say, fear not, or <laughs> some, some other such thing, because we get all diverted. And it's just exactly like what we've been talking about, Janet and uh, Michelle, that we can get diverted even by even by angels. And People can get diverted by angels. Not, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but God, gosh. Um, I think that um, many of you remember the times when people were um, running after gold dust and feathers and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, it's just like, okay, you know, you, we can get really diverted. And Daniel's, uh, the angels are always really careful of the point to Jesus and not to themselves because they are so much bigger than ours than we are. Um, and you remember that people who worship angels are worshiping demons. So they're very careful to make certain to point to God. Um, every heavenly manifestation comes to a man of God, comes to a woman of God, they point to Jesus, they point to God. Okay, uh, you're greatly loved. Understand the words I speak to you and stand upright for now I have been sent to you. Sent by whom? Sent from God. So I'm going to tell you that I have a message from God for you. So I'm not the great one. God is the great one. And then he had, when he had spoken these words to, to me, I stood up trembling. So he stood, but kind of a little bit shaky. <laughs> and he said, the things that angels always say, fear not, Daniel. From the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. Your words have been heard. 
So what did Daniel try to understand? If you remember, I think it's like two chapters ago that Daniel was asking God about the end of the age, about the end of the days. And so these last few visions that we have is the answer to that. So from the very first time, you know, uh, from the very first, Daniel started humbling himself before God and he started praying and asking God for understanding. God loves it when we ask for understanding. Okay, we do not, do not ever receive from anyone that Christianity is, is, you have to unplug your brain. That is not true. In Isaiah, we have the spirit of the Lord. He is the spirit of the Lord. He is the spirit of wisdom. He is the spirit of might. He is the spirit of understanding. He is the spirit of counsel. He is the spirit of knowledge. So knowledge, wisdom, understanding, counsel, four out of the seven spirits of God, four out of, the, of them are, have to do with the mind. So God is very mind-oriented. He made our minds. He likes the way they function, especially when they're functioning correctly and thinking about the right things. If we think about the wrong things, that's when we start stepping off the path. And we all know that. We've all done that. It is not a good idea. Uh, hopefully you wake up and say, what have I been thinking why am I depressed? I've been depressed because I've been thinking about these things and I need to be thinking about these things, which is what worship does. Right? That's why it's so corrective in nature. It isn't that God says, comes and says, I'm going to correct you now unless you're thinking wrong, but you are exposing yourself to worshiping God and God bends your mind around to where it should have been the whole time. Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I've come because of your words, and the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. 21 days. We're back to that, that time period again at the very, um, uh, the very um, same amount of time that he was lamenting. It wasn't the same time period, but the same time, um, same amount of time. So here it is. Um, this angel, we don't know his name, this angel uh, is trying to come to uh, to Daniel, but the prince of the king of Persia, of the kingdom of Persia, withstood me for 21 days. We understand that to be a demonic force. There is a demonic force over Persia. There is a demonic force over every every country assigned to every country in the world, and there's a demonic force over the United States of America. That's why we need to pray for those with authority over us. There is a demonic force over, over um, um, Israel. And if it's at all possible, that demonic force can have power. Um, you know, the, it, the more that we engage in, um, in darkness and in the things that, that would um, strengthen that demonic force, uh, the more of a problem that we'll have. And so, but Michael, one of the chief princes, we know him to be an archangel, came to help me, for I was left there with the king, uh, with the kings of Persia. So here, Michael, who is always, he's the archangel who fights. Um, Gabriel is the, is the archangel who comes with the word of the Lord and with understanding of, um, uh, of, of the, the messianic. Gabriel has already shown up to Daniel in the last chapter. This time it's not Gabriel that shows up, it's another angel, still powerful enough to put Daniel on his face um, and give all, strip him of all strength. And so um, when, we, uh, when we come against, we need to understand that this angel is having a hard time getting past this demonic thing even though he was set, sent by God. So he had to have the help of Michael in order to get through. But one of the chief princes came, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I was left there with the king of Persia, kings of Persia, so the demonic forces that are over Persia. And, I, and came to make you understand what is to happen in, to your people. We're talking about the Israelites, not the world. You'll see that in Daniel, we've said this before, that some of the things that he says affect the world and globally. And we see that very plainly because they'll say North, South, East, and West. 
he'll say, you know, he'll say things that, that um, in all the world, um, he'll use phrases like that. But in, when he talks about to your people in the latter days, he's talking about Israel. And these things are going to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. So this is not uh, a, a done deal. This is the days yet to come. Some of the things have been fulfilled, but most have not. We, um, we are uh, approaching the end times, and perhaps we're in the end times, but if we are, we're at the very beginning of it, because there are signs, there are signs, but it's not, um, and, and we, should, we should know that, that um, we should understand the signs of the times. Um, so the church today, and, and this guy was talking about rabbis today even, teach that everything is going to be fine. The kingdom is going to come in a twinkling of an eye, just like that, and everything is going to be fine. And then there's going to be perfection that happens. But that's not what the prophetic words are. The prophetic word doesn't say that. It says there's going to be a, a falling away, that there's going to be a sweeping in. It says that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. And it says that there's going to be... Um, apostasy and there's going to be um, uh, persecutions and all of those things. So it's not like, um, well, don't worry about it. Just God is going to come and everything is, everything is going to be fine. Well, God is going to come and everything is going to be fine, but it's not comfort like they're, they're speaking of. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm going to say he came against that satanic op uh, opposition in order to get through. So there are some times that we cannot overcome those kinds of things, but by prayer, fasting, ongoing prayer, it's like when we allow, I have an example for this, I guess. When, um, when we allow something to remain, then it's going to be harder to get it out. Okay. We have, um, I have in my yard had, I had in my yard some grasses that came up. I mean, I guess they're decorative grasses. I don't know they're this big, and I didn't plant them. And I guess the seed came from somebody else's house that planted them or whatever. And I just, I mean, they weren't bad looking. They were okay. And then they started taking over, and then I hated them. I thought, I gotta get rid of these. If I would have pulled those things out when they first came, there would have been no problem. I could not dig them out. My husband dug them out using a pickaxe. <laughs> so that's how terrible they were. That's how deeply they were rooted in. And that is exactly what happens when we just allow things to happen. We just allow abortion. We just allow drug abuse. We just allow um, apostasy. We just allow some terrible things. And they get rooted deeper and deeper and deeper. And we think, well, I hope God does something about this. Well, we need to do something about it. We need to at least pray. And then there may be some direction that God would give us as well. But, but it's one of those things that if, if we don't stand against things, then we have it and it will go deeper. The roots will go deeper and we will have to fight harder to get, to get out of that. Um, and that's satanic opposition. So we need to understand that we need to be faithful to the purpose that God has given us. I've said, um, I don't usually get to bring people to Jesus. I like to do that. More often than not, I get, I, I get to pray them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I also love, and clean the fish. That's all great. And, and I love it. And that's, that's – I – I was lamenting this, and God really reminded me that um, when I was in high school, there was a guy on our football team that was really, really good. I mean, he got drafted out of high school into the major leagues, and um, he was he was a great football player. And um, he, um, anybody, no, see, I don't know very much about football. So Mindy is sitting there going, "Okay, well, we'll see if she says this right." <laughs> Um, because Minnie's an old football fan. But um, 
But he worked. He only played on the defensive team, which meant that he never scored because he wasn't on the offensive team. He was on the defensive team, and um, so he never scored in all of his football career as a high school student. The last game of the season, we went to state, so we were winning every game that we that we played. And the last game of the um, uh, of the of the year, uh, they ran a special play for him put him on the offensive team and let him score. So he got to score and he was so excited because he got to score. And usually he just plays defensive. I feel like that's me. That's the, that is the uh, picture that God gave me is of my life is that I don't often get to do, get to do that, get to, to pray with the person to get to be saved in the first place and to experience that rush of, of the, the beauty of, them coming to Jesus and the and the the transformation of old things passing away, all things becoming new. It just the birth, the actual birth process where the baby comes out, you know. <laughs> just and so I don't often get to do that. Sometimes I do, and I'm just really excited. And I feel like, okay, God ran that play for me because usually I'm on the other team, the defensive team, not on the scoring team. So. Um, I don't think, I think it's important for us to do what it is that we're called to and be faithful in that and not to lament if we don't get, get to do something else. I guess my lamenting happens when people say, so how many people have you shared the gospel with here? You know, something like that. And I think I share it, but I don't, I talk to Christians more than not Christians. Uh, And that keeps me really busy. I don't know where I could put something else, but you know, Anyway. I think I think that sometimes people get caught up in that, like it, it gets into a kind of a bragging fest where really we just need to encourage each other to be obedient to whatever God has given each of us to do. You know, I should encourage That's Deborah it. to step into what God's having her do there. I should talk to Dory, encourage her on those kind of things. That's what we should be doing for each other. We don't all have the same purpose, you know, of no. what God wants. Or the to same do. gift. Or the same gift mix, or the same, you know, or the same anointing. You should, we should never try to do what other people are doing. We should try to do what God is saying to do. Jesus said that the things I do, the Father's showing me to do. The things I'm doing, God, the Father's telling me to do. So that's exactly where we should be. So back to Daniel. Sorry about that. Um, so here he is um, uh, receiving ministry from. From, uh, from this angelic being. Verse 15, when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one of the likenesses of, of the children of man touched my lip. Another reference to it, probably an angel. Touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and I spoke. And I said to him who stood before me, O Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. This vision is too big for me. This, this vision is more than I can handle. This vision is, is not something that, um, that I can process. Um, and so uh, how can my servant Lord talk with my Lord? How, how can I get in on this conversation? For now, no strength remains in me and no breath is left in me. I don't even know what's happening to Daniel. I don't know if he's having a near-death experience or what. I really don't have any idea what's happening to him absolutely physically, but I do know that he is consumed by this, um, by this, um, by this angel, by this vision, by what's happening. Now, all of this is so that he could understand the last days. Um, one of the things that is a sign of the last days is the escalation of the hatred of Israel and Jewish people. And it's escalating again. Um, it is not just the people of Israel, but also the church. As I said before, you know, that, that, that's escalating. So um, Anyway, so he um, was supposed to understand about Israel in the last days. The visions and dreams and revelations are for the future. And um, that's what the word says. It's not opinion. It's, that's what the word says. There are some people who are going to say, oh, this has already happened and that's already happened. And 
maybe, but if we don't keep it open, we'll miss it when it happens. I've said this before, probably heard me say this many times because I, I say it often and I, and I believe it. And that is, there is a whole lot of scripture about Jesus' first coming to Bethlehem as a child. I mean, the whole thing, born of a virgin. You've got all of these scriptures that Jesus fulfilled, and yet his coming was missed by so many people. I mean, the, the Jewish people were waiting for the Messiah. Maybe next year in Jerusalem they would say, are you the Messiah? Have you come yet? If, you really, if you've seen the chosen, you've seen that, you know, there's a beggar by the street saying, are you the Messiah? Is the Messiah come yet? You know, and what they're asking for is there, do we have deliverance from Rome and from the oppression that we have? So they were missing it completely. It was not that Jesus was going to come and establish his, his, the kingdom of God in Rome and overthrow the Roman government. That was so not what was going to happen. Deborah. Well, I don't remember where it's at in the Bible, but even John the Baptist questioned and said, are you, you know, and he, he yeah. was preparing the way and baptizing him and everything. And then still somewhere in his mind, he was like, well, are you? And, and Jesus responds, what have I done since I've been, or what have you seen, you know, or I, I don't know the verses, but, you know, yeah, but it's okay. uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Exactly. I mean, John the Baptist, poor guy. I mean, he was, he was arrested. He was in prison. He didn't see all the stuff that was going on with Jesus. And so, and yet you're right. He saw uh, the dove come down from heaven, the voice from heaven is my beloved son, whom I will please, you know? So what, where was the disconnect? The disconnect was, well, wait a second. Do I have to die? Are we overthrowing Rome? What What's going on? Yeah. So they really didn't, because there is the Messiah picture, the messianic picture of the king of kings, the Lord of lords, riding on a white horse and coming before, uh, you know, coming in might and power. Yeah, and it's going to happen because that's the second coming of Jesus. But the first coming, they didn't see that it was both. In fact, there were some schools of thought that some rabbis had that there would be two messiahs. Because they were so radically different, they couldn't, they couldn't figure out how they could both be the same person. It didn't make any sense. And there's a lot of times I think that we need to study the scripture and just let it sit in our, in our hearts and our lives. And so that when something happens, we go, oh, that's what that is. I see that. Damn it. Well, remember, that's what Mary did. She took the things that were given to her and she pondered them in her heart. Sometimes we just have yeah. to put it up on a shelf and see what God keeps speaking to us on it. You know, we, we don't necessarily find out everything all at once. You know, we can, we can hear, we can think that we have it, but, you know, I mean, sometimes it just takes a while to figure things out. And we might not know everything, but that shouldn't, um, that shouldn't keep us from serving the Lord with all of our heart. That's exactly right. That's um, just bottom line. We need to have an up-to-date relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't need to let it grow cold. That's very, that's what he wants. That's what the enemy wants is to, is to have our relationship with God grow cold. And if that's where you are, let me tell you, the Bible says when that happened in Revelation to one of the churches, you've lost your first love. The answer to that was in the next verse. It says, do the things you did before. Do the things you did before. So what did you do before that got you white hot for Jesus? What that got you so involved in who God is and who and whose you are. You know, my guess is that you were in the word. My guess is that you were worshiping. My guess is that you were praying in the spirit. My guess is, I mean, you were doing the things that you were supposed to do that would give you strength. Okay, I am going to make it true, even though we have zero time left. Um, <laughs> verse 18, I'm just going to take this really quick. Anyway, 
Again, one having the appearance of man touched me and strengthened me. Look at how these angels are ministering to to Daniel. Hallelujah. We also have angels that minister to us. You may not be aware of it, but you do have angels that minister to you. That's a good thing. We should not be worshiping angels. We should not be praying to angels. We should not be, in my opinion, I've heard some people do this. I just don't think that that's right. Uh, We should not be commanding angels. Angels are not under our jurisdiction. They are under God's jurisdiction. And that's him. If you need some help, God is going to send the angel to you. You don't command the angel to come to you. That's really ridiculous. I have a big problem with that. Anyway, so we can get off on those things that are not so little when when you really think about it. Again, one having the appearance of man touched me and strengthened me. So angels ministering to Daniel. And he said, oh, man, greatly loved. Daniel, every time an angel shows up, you are greatly loved. You're favored. You're one of my favorites. I love you so much. I, I know that you adore me. I know that you praise me. And so what does, you know, so God says, hey, I love you too. You know, man, greatly loved. Fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke, okay, this is the angel speaking, but he's speaking the words of God. That's what angels do. They speak the words of God. They don't speak their own words. They're a lot better at that than we are. (laughs) They don't speak their own words. They speak the words of God. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, do you know why I came to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come, but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side except these, except Michael, your prince. So Michael is still fighting the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. If you remember that, those are the two kingdoms that arise. And it's been repeated throughout this book of Daniel. We saw it in Nebuchadnezzar's first dream. We saw it in the other in the next vision. We saw it in um, in another one of the, uh, two other of Daniel's uh, visions about the horns that come out and all that kind of stuff. Those two kingdoms that rise out. The first one is Persia. The second one is Greece. So Persia, um, you know, in these last days, we can easily see that Iran uh, is is. In the place of Persia, it is that is the country of Persia. They still, in some places of Iran, speak Persian instead of Farsi. So um, it is definitely what what's being talked about here. And then another rises up, which is Greece or the goat, if you remember that. Um, not modern Greece. It's probably Europe, maybe um, the Byzantine area. It's it's that whole Roman thing. So all of of where Rome was. Rome, as you know, maybe you, if you remember your history, Rome uh, was divided into two places, Rome and Byzantine. The Byzantine Empire lasted a thousand years longer than Rome did. And so it really could be Rome, that, I mean, that Byzantine area that he's talking about, which is when um, uh, Constantine moved the capital of from Rome to um, Istanbul and called it Constantinople. So, oh, sometimes we have to have a lot of history here. Anyway, <laughs> so he's registered. I love this. It says, I will tell you what's inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends in my side except Daniel, your prince. And I'm telling you, I told you at the beginning that this is going to be the introduction of chapter uh, 11. So next week, we're going to talk about what that next that next place is. So he's been strengthened by Michael. Um, he prepares Michael with the word Michael, the name Michael is who is like God. Um, and so uh, this is the angel saying, I've come to, you know, to tell you a, a great thing. And he spent the whole chapter lifting Daniel up out of the, off the floor because because his appearance just did it. <laughs> so that's that's where we're at, and that's where we're going to take up next week. Questions, comments?
I'll just say I was reading in the Amplified um, part of the time. I was switching back and forth. And whenever the angel is talking there, they always have in parentheses, Gabriel. So mm -hmm. it's interesting because not all the translations say those things. So, you know, it's just as we keep reading the word of God and we keep finding out more things and it's always interesting. Well, um, that, uh, that understanding that it's, the last time that, that Gabriel really showed up, he was named as Gabriel. And so that's why most commentators don't think this one was Gabriel. Right. They, um, uh, but um, the amplified version um, takes a lot of liberties in, in all kinds of areas. Mm -hmm. I love the amplified, but you know, you have to understand that it's not a real translation. But I love it because I like synonyms. <laughs> and it doesn't bother me at all to read it like that. Anybody uh, else? Never mind. Yes, Deborah. Just a comment. So um, Daniel's getting all these prophetic visions and everything. And then if you go back through all the prophets in the Old Testament, I mean, they all were a little overwhelmed by the stuff that God sent them because it's so hard to interpret. I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, God is telling them all this stuff and they're just on the earth trying to get through and trying to bring people back to God where they're supposed to. And then they're telling them all this stuff that's almost like in code. I don't know. You know? It is in code. And Deborah, you are so right. I would, I don't think I'd ever make it off my face. I mean, Daniel made it, made it on his, on his hands and knees and by the help of the angel it stood straight up on shaky. I don't think I would have made it at all. So it, yeah, he, and, and the prophets are just different. You know, they're just really different kinds of people. And, um, they're all amazing. Actually, Daniel isn't, isn't it interesting? Daniel isn't, wasn't thought of as a prophet um, by the rabbis, but Jesus called him a prophet. So Jesus mm -hmm. is the first one who, who calls Daniel a prophet because he didn't really prophesy. He saw visions. So he was really a seer, but um, obviously he has huge prophetic words. And obviously we've seen them come to pass, some of them. And because we've seen them come to pass, we know that God is faithful and the rest of them will come to pass too. I'm just, I, just have, I just have a comment too, um, like what Deborah is saying and what you're saying that the prophets were different. Well, the prophetic people, a lot of them today are different. They, they mm -hmm. kind of, they march to a, the beat of a different drummer, so to speak. It's the same drummer, but they hear it and see it differently. And that's, I think that's what makes them prophetic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you see things, when you see things like John did, when you see things like Daniel did, you, you know, you're kind of affected. Um, in, in prayer, um, when I was praying at the church one time um, by myself, it's early in the morning, and um, and I've been praying about the angels that we believed encamped around the church. And Pastor Bob had prayed that there would be four angels at the four corners, and um, so he had prayed that. So I thought, so I felt pray too. You know, <laughs> my my leader, I can pray it like he prays. And so, um, so I was praying about. Um, about who God has stationed around those four corners. And, and I actually saw one of the angels and I wasn't, I, I was undone. I just, and I didn't see the whole angel because, um, well, you know how tall the, the roof is. I saw him over in the global corner that where the global map is before the global map was there, but in that, in that area. And, um, and I saw his robe and I saw him up to about his waist and all the rest of him was above the um, ceiling. He didn't talk to me. 
as far as I know, he didn't know that I saw him or I didn't know that I, uh, but I was then then, you know, so uh, I, I don't even know what to say about that. I don't know why I saw him. I, and I wasn't any really good for the rest of the day. And it totally impacted me. Um, I don't talk about it very much because it was crazy. And um, I spent some other time praying about about those four angels and God gave me the names of them at one point and 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 told me to pray into their ministry to the people of God. Ah, but that gets really crazy. I mean, <laughs> you know, you think, am I really doing this? this is, is this okay? You know, because it's like, it's so weird. But um, I don't know. The things of God are extremely, I think they're extremely normal and that our life in this world is what's abnormal. And so when we come into the normalcy of walking with God, that's powerful. We get that when we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's just this otherworldliness that happens when we think and we feel the power of God most of the time when we, and even after that, there are times when, when you're praying in the spirit and you know you're interceding for something deep. Um, Janet, I know you do that all a lot, and I know that there, Michelle and all of you probably have had deep intercessions where you just feel like uh, you're just carried away by the power of God. Um, but I think that should be normal, more normal than it is for us. Um, I I want more of that. I think that if we walk in that more, I think it will put us in good stead for end days. Because I think there's a there's a power there. When you see, and again, I haven't really seen an angel like Daniel, but when you see that or you experience the power of God coming close, it erases some of the doubts that you might have. You know, it just puts the perspective on it and goes, oh, no, 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 I know that God is real. I mean, there, you know, no, you can't, you can't destroy that one. So it I think sounds to me people, like, it sounds to me like that may have been God's uh, or Holy Spirit, whoever sent, sent him, whoever sent that message to you, the ability, which might have been Holy Spirit. It, it was an affirmation to you. It, I mean, I think it was what so many people call a God sighting, but it's beyond that. It's an affirmation that you're on the right track, that you are praying into what them and that they're really there. And it's a gift. I, I think that was a gift, Jan. That, that angel was, um, yeah, that angel was a pillar and that angel was like worship and praise and, the interesting thing was, especially at that time, but even now, uh, that corner uh, in the church when, during worship is a lot of time where, where people, I see them weeping, I see them dancing, there's a lot of activity in, that goes on in that corner, which is kind of interesting, but anyway. Can I come to that corner next time I'm by you? <laughs> <laughs> when you come, I'll show you that corner. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I'm there. I'm I'm so there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we I, we love it when you're here. That's for sure. I love it when you're with us in this group too. So let's pray real quick, and because um, I went way over time, and I didn't really mean to, but I don't like to. I don't like to do all the talking and then not have any any interaction at the end. So. Yeah, it, ooh, quarter after. Okay. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you that um, and that you are the God who is with us. Whether we see angelic beings or we see the fingerprints of your moving in, in, in amongst us, or whether we see nothing because we're in that season of our lives when when we take have to have a walk of faith where we don't see things because. Faith is evidence of things hoped for and not seen. So, Lord, whether wherever stage we're in, Lord, I know that it comes back around to 
manifestations of you. Um, and then comes the time that, that we don't really see or hear you very much. And, and we have this walk of faith that strengthens us in different ways. Lord, I thank you for each of these people that uh, are on this call. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would have communicated your word well. And um, I know that, um, that um, I try to do that, but I also know, Lord, that I fall short. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you take up the slack and you teach uh, where, I, where I don't and, um, and that we learn from you. Thank you that your word is living and powerful and sharp. And I thank you, Father, for any sharpening that you did tonight. And I ask, Lord, that we would remain sharp, um, men and women of God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love you guys. It's always good to see you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.